the house of wisdom. The Bible talks about this, and it's very good to study it today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. The name of this program, of course, is Quick Study Television. We want to welcome you. Welcome here. It's great to see you as we study in today's study, 9 through 11 of the book of Proverbs. We go from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 every year. And this is very good. One person helps us do that is Corey. Corey, what's up? I'm going to be taking a look at some ancient authority structures today. All right, ancient authority structures. That should be fascinating. And what did you do? Well, since it's Friday, we have a fabulous question, and it will be from Proverbs chapter 9. So make sure to tune your ears and get your eyes reading that proverb if you haven't already yet. All right, very good. I look forward to that. Well, my kids do anyway. <laughs> Ryan, what's up? Today I'm studying the life of Ahithophel the Gilanite. Who's that? Join me later as we explore the account of this somewhat mysterious character. On yesterday's program, you and I took a look at the scribes and the Pharisees from the first century AD, the time period of the New Testament of the Bible. Today, we're going to be focusing in on the Sadducees and the ruling religious body of the Sanhedrin. Now, the reason that we're taking a look at this right now is because I think it's, it has an interesting tie and import with wisdom literature. These were These leaders were supposed to be religiously wise. The Sanhedrin appears in the New Testament of the Bible as a ruling body of men presiding over the religious affairs of Judaism. Information about the Sanhedrin directly from the first century AD, which is the time of the New Testament, is limited. So resources must be drawn from the later written accounts of Judaism. This is why scholars are still unsure whether during the days of Jesus there was a permanent Great Sanhedrin centered in Jerusalem, or if there were many smaller territorial Sanhedrins and one larger one that could be called upon when needed in Jerusalem. What is known is that the ideal number of members seems to have been 71, presided over by the high priest. The members came from any sect of belief within Judaism, mainly consisting of Pharisees and Sadducees. Even though Pharisees appear to have outnumbered Sadducees in popularity and overall numbers, it also appears that the Sadducees still managed to outnumber the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin, likely due to their temperament and place within the temple. Sadducees generally came from the upper classes of society, and many from priestly families. Historically, they supported the Hasmonean dynasty of kings that arose during the intertestamental time period, and they had made their peace with Hellenization. In other words, they were okay with mixing Judaism with Greek and Roman culture. They rejected the oral law of the Pharisees, believing that while the entire Old Testament was inspired by God, only the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, could be used to build doctrine or teaching upon. This meant that the Sadducees rejected the existence of angels and demons, a bodily resurrection, and the immortality of the soul, and they emphasized human free will over the predestination of God. The Sadducees, however, were extremely tied to the temple service in Jerusalem, largely being from priestly families, and were responsible for its upkeep and taxes. Apparently, by Jesus' day, they had become very wealthy through it as well. While this did them well for a time, it also meant that their order did not survive the Roman destruction of the temple in AD 70. One of the things that I really sticks out to me when I'm reading through the New Testament, when I'm studying not only Proverbs, but also these different people groups, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, is how it's such human nature to try to dissect and understand the law of God uh, and, and, and even the life of Jesus Christ. And that's a good thing inherently. We are supposed to be really focusing and, and trying to figure out what God is saying to us through the Bible. But a lot of times, we'll have uh, differences with, within each other, you know, even as Christians uh, and even within first century Judaism, we see these differences and some of them were bigger than others. And yet they still managed to work together just as Christians. That's what we need to do as well. We're going to have denominational differences. So little beliefs that are different from one another. Uh, as long as our core belief is on Jesus Christ as the son of God with his redemptive sacrifice and the confession of him and the belief in your heart uh, uh, is what brings a person 
into salvation, then we're Christians. We're all a part of the body of Christ and we need to work together. But one of the things that I find really interesting is that even though all of those differences were, were within first century Judaism, they were all slightly wrong, weren't they? When, when, when Christ came as the Messiah, he fulfilled the law. He came and he really challenged their beliefs and that was difficult for them. Well, we need to be challenged by the person of Jesus Christ as well as Christians. We have all of these human beliefs floating around. But what does God say? The ninth chapter of Proverbs highlights wisdom's work for all who need it. In other words, everyone. Proverbs 9.4 says, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. The book speaks to us as people in need of knowledge, in need of wisdom and understanding, three things critical to understanding life. What is important, what is not. From these proverbs, we learn some people are not as smart as we or they think they are, especially now. Media has attributed to most of us a unique level of stupidity. The news in today's world is frequently misleading. One way or another, we'll find out. Only rarely do we find the truth. We read the book of Proverbs, however, to learn about life and how we are to live it. Today, with many ways to spend our money, we should seek divine wisdom. Proverbs 9, verses 1 through 12. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat, she has mixed her wine, she has also furnished her table. She has sent out her maidens, she cries out from the highest places of the city, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake foolishness and live, and go in the way of understanding. He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself, and if you scoff, you will bear it alone. Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. I love this study. We're looking at Proverbs chapter nine, the ninth book or the ninth chapter in this amazing book of wisdom. Listen to the way it starts. Wisdom has built her house. Wisdom has built her house and she has hewn her seven pillars. I want to tell you something that is amazing. I mean, God says to us, listen, this is what wisdom has done. And we need wisdom to live today, beloved. We must understand if you have your book, this is the Bible guide. Turn to Proverbs. It's several pages, 38 pages. And we write it for you every single month. This is mine. It's a little torn up because I use it all the time. But anyway, this is a book that has a paragraph and three points that we put on the program. But also it has other material at the bottom, the prayer and everything else. And so I want to encourage you to get a hold of yours as we continue to study the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 9 is an amazing book. And as we look at the ways of truth, think about this. God has built wisdom. Now, I know that 
Human beings are sinners. We know that. Jesus came for us 2,000 years ago. He died on the cross. Sin is not a new concept. We sinned. And when we sinned, there was a result of death. Death is a result of sin. And sin was not a part of uh, what we had in mind or what God had in mind for us. But we live with sin until we get to heaven, when we get a new body. And when we do that, that becomes very exciting. But God wrote a book called Proverbs for us through the Holy Spirit and through his servants. And this book is interesting. In the ways of truth, we talk about the house of wisdom. Wisdom is a very interesting thing. You know, it's partly spiritual and partly physical, of course. And if, or me, mental, of course, because spiritual is mental as well. Proverbs chapter 9 through 11, that's what we read as we go through the Bible. Now, if you're going through the Bible with us, just catch up right now where you are. But today, we're going to focus on Proverbs chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. And as we look at it, may God help us. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us to understand the passage today as we read it. We need to learn it. We need to know God. Show us your ways. Teach us your paths. O oh Lord, our God, in Jesus name. Amen. Look at the first verses here in Proverbs chapter nine. It comes up and it says, wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent out her maidens. She cries out from the highest places of the city. Whoever is simple, let him turn and hear. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake foolishness, get rid of foolishness and live. Go in the way of understanding. You know, that's very important, beloved. You see, we must choose to forsake foolishness and live. We have a choice to make today. We must follow the way of God's wisdom. A lot of people say to me, well, uh, you know, I have wisdom or, uh, you know, they, they say, well, Rod, I have wisdom. And, you know, I, I just think that there's, we, we just don't understand wisdom. Wisdom is not in a person that lives a long time. That's not wisdom. Wisdom is not in somebody who's smart, got a, you know, soaring IQ. That's not wisdom. Wisdom very much has a spiritual component to it that only comes when we invite Jesus Christ into our heart and we say, Lord, be Lord of my life. Then the Holy Spirit has a deposit of wisdom for us to live. And that wisdom guides us individually in our work and our way. We need to understand that, beloved. We need to make the decision to follow God so that we can have the wisdom above anything else and everybody else. You know, this is, this is not a self-help, you know, seminar that gets you, you know, for $800, you can take it. And no, this is in the Bible. This is free of charge if you watch this program. It's in the Bible. I mean, people have paid for you to be on this program, for us to be on this program to talk to you. But I... I, I need to let you know that it's not a seminar that you go to. Very important that you have to pay for. Look at Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7. It says, he who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself. He who rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hates you. Rebuke a wise man. This is interesting. This is the opposite and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will still be wiser. Teach a just man, he will increase learning. Beloved, so important. We are wise to listen to correction. We are wrong to assume every idea, or we are wrong to assume every idea is foolish. See, we have to understand something. We need to understand that wisdom from God comes to us in a real way. That not everything God says is for us to decide. God's commands are from him. He never tells us something that is not good for us. I know that's hard for some people to think about, but it's true. When we listen and truly hear the Lord, now that's the, the uh, really exciting part is making sure you can hear God. 
But when you truly hear God, then all of a sudden, Jesus Christ, we recognize that, that is true wisdom. And that is Jesus Christ telling us how to act, how to react and what to do. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. That's what Jesus said. Now that's very interesting, isn't it? Well, let's go on to Proverbs chapter nine, verse 10. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me, your days will be multiplied and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you will bear it alone. Which brings me to this point. Knowledge of God and his redemption, what Jesus did, is good. We must alone bear the consequences of our decisions. See, I, I try to tell people this, and it's really interesting because uh, people say to me, well, whose advice are you following anyway? I say, well, I, I pray and I try to follow the advice of Jesus Christ, which is in the Bible, because I will give account for what I did in this life in the next, there is a judgment seat of Christ and a judgment seat at the great white throne. And that's a problem. That's revelation. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is with what you have, what I gave you. What did you do with it? I want to be able to say, Lord, I did everything I could. I told people about you, how to find you. I did everything I could. What about you? That's wisdom. What we say affects how we act. How we act affects how we are thought of. Now we'll talk about that on the next program, 15 to 17 of the book of Proverbs. It is very good. I want to encourage you to join us. In the meantime, here's Ryan. Well, yesterday we looked at the life of King David, arguably Israel's greatest king to ever live. But behind every great king is also usually a great administration of staff. For David, this was certainly true. Today we examine one of those members of David's cabinet, his wise and faithful counselor, Ahithophel the Gilonite. Unfortunately, after many years of faithful service to the king, though, he suddenly turns on him. For any ruler in history to have a long and successful reign, a circle of loyal allies was essential. King David, arguably Israel's greatest king to ever live, was no exception. Though David's mighty men were most notable, there were also other key members of his administration. One of his most valuable was his wise and faithful counselor, Ahithophel the Gilonite. The Bible says of him, the advice of Ahithophel was as if one had inquired at the oracle of God. Ahithophel faithfully and lovingly served David for a great many years, which is why it comes as such a shock to read about his sudden betrayal of the king. The defection occurs when David's son Absalom attempts to usurp the throne. And not only does Ahithophel join Absalom, but even goes so far as to offer to kill David personally. Ahithophel also advises Absalom to openly have sexual relations with his father's concubines on the roof of the palace, which he does. Why the sudden hatred and betrayal? Who exactly is this mysterious figure? It seems to all go back to David's affair with Bathsheba, which occurred many years earlier. 2 Samuel 11.3 reveals that Bathsheba was the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. 2 Samuel 23 gives the additional detail that both of these men, the father and husband of Bathsheba, were mighty men of David, and that Ahithophel the Gilonite was Eliam's father. That makes Bathsheba the granddaughter of Ahithophel. As one Bible scholar powerfully put it, as David's counselor in the palace, Ahithophel must have burned with rage to know his king had betrayed his granddaughter's honor and killed Uriah, her husband, who was a fellow soldier with his son Eliam, Bathsheba's father. 
However, there was nothing he could do at that time to exact his revenge. If he had risen in anger against the king, he would have lost his life. So he remained silent, keeping his thoughts of revenge secretly to himself all of the years that followed until he saw opportunity to destroy King David. This also sheds light on Ahithophel's strange advice to Absalom to openly have sexual relations with David's concubines. He was attempting to get his revenge by encouraging Absalom to do the same thing to David's concubines as the king had done to his granddaughter. However, in the end, Absalom did not follow through with Ahithophel's offer to murder the king. For the Lord, the Bible records, had purposed to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom. God had answered David's plea, for when David heard of Ahithophel's betrayal, he prays, O Lord, turn the advice of Ahithophel into foolishness. Sadly, when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he returns to his own city, puts his house in order, and hangs himself. This is truly a tragic and heartbreaking story, and we can learn a lot from it. For instance, notice that all this mess goes back to David's double sin, his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. I'm sure in the heat of the moment, David wasn't even thinking about the repercussions of that sin, but it would be so damaging that it would not only hurt David and his family, but those around him as well. This tragic example should help motivate us to be very careful what we do. Our sin hurts more than just ourselves. When we're struggling, we must pray for God's strength. Jesus gave us a powerful model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. It goes like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And listen to the end, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. That's interesting, Ryan, because you end with the Lord's Prayer, and I try to, every time I pray, I try to remember, and I think I do most of the time, to say the Lord's Prayer when I begin to pray. Mm -hmm. And that becomes important for us, and, and I do that because Jesus Christ taught us mm -hmm. to do that, and he taught his disciples to do that, and so it's very interesting. Well, it's a good practice. I know a number of people who, who do that. First, first thing, yeah. as soon as they get up. And I think it's, I think it's good practice. Yeah, Matthew 6, I mean, it's excellent. Uh, very good. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Very, very important. You know, Corey, you mentioned as well in your segment, you were talking about the idea of, uh, you know, in yesterday's segment or the last time we did this, you were talking about um, tradition on tradition. Yes. And then you're talking about how that the different denominations in their traditions have ideas about God. I find this amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I came to realize about halfway through my, well, less than halfway, about 10 years into my salvation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting. What do you mean by that? Are you saying that the Jehovah or the uh, uh, the people who are in this denomination are right with the people who are in this denomination? Which one's right? I mean, the Baptist or the Pentecostal? Right. Well, obviously, I have my own opinions because uh, you know I study the Word of God and I, I look at church doctrines and things like that. But without getting into semantics, it's quite possible that neither of them are right on this. I mean, I, I, the most important part is that as Christians, we all need to be part of the same body. So we're going to have minor differences as long as our core beliefs, the beliefs about Jesus Christ are the same. We need to be able to be gracious enough with one another, with one another to work together uh, and, and work with one another and recognize that we're all Christians and we all, you know, are part of the same body. Now, as soon as it gets into salvation issues, so different beliefs about Jesus Christ, there are lines that have to be drawn um, around, you know, who's in Christianity and who's not in Christianity. But I digress. What really, when you're talking about first century Judaism and you look at cr modern Christianity, um, you know, we have to be really gracious with, with one another and we have to be open to change when, when it comes to God, allowing God to speak to us. Our denomination, denominational teaching, so what we have grown up with, what our traditions are, they can't be so cemented in us because they are not scripture. They're interpretations of scripture. So we have to be open to God changing our beliefs. And, and you know, that's 
a hard thing to do. It, it requires a confidence in, you know, mm -hmm. God is truth. Jesus Christ is my salvation. He is what's getting me to heaven. So it requires a confidence in that to be able to go, okay, maybe not everything. Maybe I'm not 100% right on everything. Uh, but, you know, you study and you work through it. But it's very possible that like Jesus challenged the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, that God will challenge us as, Pente as Pentecostals, as Baptists, uh, you know, and, and mm -hmm. all the different denominations, Anglicans, all the different denominations right. that exist. So, so in, in other words, uh, the, we believe that Jesus Christ was from God, born of a virgin. The Holy Spirit came to Mary and, you know, uh, Jesus was born and he was fully God and fully man. He died on the cross, mm -hmm. allowed himself to be killed on the cross and to pay the cost of sin. That mm -hmm. was the cost of sin. And then he was, he died. And then three days later, he arose from the dead yeah. miraculously. And he was a unique person because all of the sudden he had his flesh, he could eat and everything, but yet he was, he was, you know, with God, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. You know? And so this was a new creation. So anybody who believes that is a Christian, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. Yeah. That's what you have to be. Mm -hmm. And anybody who does not believe that about Jesus Christ, well, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not a good situation, in my opinion. No, I mean, salvation requirements are outlined in the New Testament when you, I mean, one really quick example is when you look at the book of Romans. So you have to, you have to have certain core beliefs about Jesus and then beliefs about, you know, uh, what exactly is heaven like? What exactly is hell like? Things like that. There are differences within Christianity that exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're allowed to have strong opinions on it, but you have to be gracious with your other Christian brothers and That's sisters right. that think differently. Mm -hmm. You know, we're out of time now. We yeah. got to get to the question yes. and because I'm not avoiding it, but I want to carry this on tomorrow because <laughs> it's a, there's sure. some other things we can talk about sure. that are really good. Anyway, what's the question. Well, it's going to be a very easy question to anybody who's been paying attention to today's program, and especially if you have read Proverbs 9, because it happens to come from the very first verse. So here it is. According to Proverbs chapter 9, how many pillars has wisdom hewn out to build her house? Three, five, or seven? There you go. You can use your fingers if you well. can't talk, Brian. So, I mean, you know, you're in good shape. Yeah, I'm losing my voice. That's true. Um, <laughs> now, I know that the both of you have not been involved in the tapings up until today. Dad, just and give us a finger count. That was going to be, that was what I was going to say, to be fair. It's a good number. I mean, you know. It is what I was going to say. Seven. Yeah. Seven. Are, well, seven. Yeah, we've both read it several times today. And so maybe you have as well. And you would know that that is exactly the right answer. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. That is Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1. Very well done. Number seven means complete and fullness. So there you go. Good job. I'm sure you got the answer right as well.